Can crush a cap work at Massey's? A crown block for the new launch tower at Sanchez? The small block of land finally acquired by SpaceX at the build site? And a broken CC8800 crane at the launch site? Hey everyone and welcome on board to RGV Aerial Photography's Starbase Flyover Update Episode 54. I'm Jeff A, your guide for today. We'll be covering updates at SpaceX's Starbase facilities, cruising at an altitude of 10,500 feet. These photos were taken on the 9th of August amongst an increasing amount of developing clouds. Let's start as usual over at the Massey's rocket testing facility. Here's a labelled map to get your bearings, thanks to Procky for creating them. Beginning with recent events, Ship 30 was transported to the Massey's test site on Tuesday, August 6th. It then conducted a spin prime test on the 7th, where it was then rolled back to the build site on the 9th. Anthony Gomez from the Rocket Ranch took this great video of its travels. After being lifted from the static fire stand to a transport stand, it was then moved into the Rocket Garden. While we're at the static fire facility, crews have been replacing an oxygen drain line with one of the new types of diffusers. We can see where the exhaust used to be on these racks and the new diffuser nearby. The western perimeter is still waiting a concrete finish. The sides of the approach ramp seem to have suffered a fair amount of erosion during the recent storms. At the new structural test stand, hydraulic pistons have been mounted to the former can crusher cap. These simulate lateral forces on the test article. Over at the airport storage facility, we continue to find new little items, and this week it's the three hydraulic dampers from the recent upgrades to Tower 1's chopsticks landing rail. Let's move on to Sanchez, shall we? Let's take a quick look at the map to familiarise ourselves. Sanchez has not seen much activity during the last couple of weeks. Let's start at the Star Factory stand construction area with not much progress seen. We have the speculated booster thrust puck work stand and the ship engine install access stands that weren't moved to Mega B2 just yet. Hopefully by the next flyover, we won't see them around here anymore. At the storage area, the cleanup hasn't advanced, but now we see more parts distributed on the ground. A very strange move, but we will keep an eye out here. Moving to the tower staging area, Module 7 had not moved to the launch site just yet due to some repair work with the CC8800-1 crane, but SBMTs were ready to go once the crane was up and running. The module would roll to the launch site in the early morning hours of the 13th. Module 8 is ready to go too, with all the scaffolding installed. The most interesting development is with Module 9, which is the top part of the tower. And that's the crown block, and four single sheaves are staged near the tower. We can see the new crown block is a little different from the one installed on Tower A. In the days following our flyover, it's been observed that all of these parts are now installed, beginning the installation of the pulley system for the chopsticks. Speaking about the chopsticks, the missing hydraulic actuator finally appeared. We had been searching for it for quite a while. This appears to be the one removed from the left chopstick of Tower 1, and has been stripped down and prepared for transport for possible refurbishment off-site. Now rolling to the gas power plant, where the extension has its roof, some windows and even a rolling door. This extension looks like it will be for storage rather than more generators or transformers like we speculated last week. Finally at the rocket garden, Ship 30 was moved to Massey's ahead of testing, but as of the recording of this video, it is back here for final preparations ahead of integrated testing and launch. Now let's take a look at the build site. We have some interesting news at the build site this week, as SpaceX continues to expand their manufacturing capacity for Starship. First, we'll start at Mega Bay 2, where work is all but complete on the worker access platform surrounding the ship workstations. Looking at the top level, the last two glass panels were finally being installed at the time of the flyover, after a few months pause in work. Inside the bay itself, SpaceX is making fast work of Ship 33, which was stacked with a three-ring liquid oxygen section on August 8th. Now looking at Mega Bay 1, there are no noticeable changes with boosters 12, 13, 14 and 15. Sitting just inside the door, four grid fin motors can be seen on pallets. It seems one of the boosters is getting replacements or upgrades. It's worth noting that SpaceX stated in a tweet that Flight 5, Starship and Super Heavy are ready to fly, pending regulatory approval. This will be Ship 30 and Booster 12. Keep an eye out for road closures in the following days and weeks for their rollout to the launch site for a wet dress rehearsal. Over in the high bay, we have a great view of Ship 31 as it begins the long process of heat shield replacement. In this image, we can see scaffolding has surrounded the ship, and the nose cone has started to have its tiles removed. 
Before we head to the office building, let's take a look behind Star Factory where a ship block 2 aft flap can be seen. To the side are aero covers. The general shape of these aft flaps will remain unchanged, although it's possible they'll be thinner compared to block 1. To the side, formwork is placed for a concrete pour to cover the various pipes and plumbings connecting the office building to HVAC equipment. At the office building, much has changed. Starting off with the big news, we found out on August 7th that the plot of land between the office building and Star Factory has officially been acquired by SpaceX. The final price is rumoured to be $15 million. Between the two buildings, work is ongoing with a new structure that will likely connect them. White steel beams have been staged and raised in a construction style not similar to either surrounding buildings. The footings we mentioned last week were since poured with concrete. An additional footing has appeared between the third corner of the office building and the already poured footings, hinting at the general shape this building will take. We can also see that the third floor of the office building has been poured and the triangle shaped hole in the roof we speculated might be for Hoppy remains open. The glass has been mainly finished on the second floor and now continues to be installed on the third along the San Martin Boulevard side with crews painting the steelwork on the rest of the levels around the corner white. We can see that the lower floor along the Highway 4 side will have a solid wall to match the front of the Star Factory. Over on the northwest wing, the side facing San Martin Boulevard looks like it will also be a solid wall. In the corner of this area, the electrical work includes new conduits with risers, likely for a transformer pad. In the nearby ring yard, a new payload barrel section is turned up. Looking closely, we can see where the payload bay door should be from the gap in the stringers. As with most of the articles seen in this area, it is speculated to be a yet another Pathfinder item. The new rec centre area is being built up similar to the new housing blocks in the village to lift it above the flood water level. The dirt is coming in from the huge mound of soil at the launch site and being piled up near the Starlink building. Now, let's zoom over to the launch site. After our short hop from the build site, let's take a moment with this week's labelled map before we get started. With the stacking of the tower waiting on crane modifications, let's first see where we are with the process. At the time of our flyover, we can see that the spare sections seen near the entrance have been installed. Just to the side we see a 6 meter section of boom that is not being used for this taller configuration. In this image from Starby Surfer, on August 9th the crane was lifted to the jackknifed position. But things would not go as planned unfortunately, as it appears some parts were not removed from the configuration as they should have been. Here we can see the luffing jib backstays are slightly slack which caused a failure of the outrigger cylinder attachment points. These devices are used to stabilise the luffing mast but with the longer than proper backstays the weight of the luffing jib would bear to these struts instead of the stays as they should. The struts would become overloaded and break causing the boom to swing loose until the slack in the backstays became taut. After crews did some initial inspections with the crane partially up, the boom would be laid back down on August 10th for further evaluation and subsequent repairs. The cylinders would be removed later that day. In this clip from Lab Padre's Nerdle Cam, thanks to Vix, we can see the process of the excess backstay pendants being removed. The morning of August 12th would see the arrival of a single replacement cylinder and the damaged units taken away. Early models of this crane only used a single outrigger cylinder, so there was speculation they may do the same. And in the early afternoon, that would hold true as the crane would be raised to reef the blocks and finally go up fully vertical that evening. Now shifting to pad B construction at the flame trench, sheet pile installation continues as we've seen over the last couple of weeks. To the south, we can now see more progress with the jet grouting process. It is still unclear the exact pattern the grout is being injected, however, the excavated area might suggest they are creating a wall structure that may outline the flame trench area. In this larger pit, we can finally see the tops of two piles, confirming that these were not filled with concrete and rebar to the surface. Behind the tower to the northeast, further installation of steel structures with a drawworks winch will be placed has been seen. Last week we commented on a trench between the tower and the excavated pit. After just a few days, we see the three electrical vaults have been placed alongside the tower pile cap with electrical conduits running into the area where the trench once was, having been backfilled and compacted for the next modules to arrive once the crane is repaired and ready to continue stacking. The wall structure within the pit has taken good shape this week, with evidence continuing to mount that this will be a fluids bunker for the new pad. 
Rebar seems to be largely finished with formwork starting to be placed for the walls, with voids seen here on the south and west walls that likely allow pipework to exit in the direction of the tower and OLM trenches yet to be dug. At the middle of the site, we can now see the concrete of the new entrance to the launch site as it was poured since last week's flyover. The previous D2 gate location is now completely closed and temporary barriers and the guard shack container has been moved next to Hoppy, making the gate relocation official. Toward the tank farm, we can see that the remainder of the ramp to the former suborbital pad A is also being demolished in preparation of the expanded tank farm moving in that direction. Activity at the tank farm was very quiet this week, however we can now see that all remaining parts of the vertical tanks are gone, leaving only vague outlines of where they once stood. Just along the berm wall, we can see a second length of blue pipe has been assembled. Additional segments can also be seen nearby. Growing speculation may be that these will be used to test parts of the chopstick catch system that B14.1 may not be optimally suited for. Tower 1 at Pad A has seen panels of blast shielding removed in recent days. The panels have been staged at the edge of the pad and the purpose was initially unclear as no replacements had been spotted. The morning of August 12th would clear things up though, as new larger gusset plates would be seen lifted into place connecting the middle of the horizontal beams to the angled beams. It seems like once this is finished, the existing panels will be reinstalled. At the OLM, we see B14.1 now sitting on top a largely cleared launch ring in preparation for catch testing. The chopsticks, as reported over the last couple of weeks, continue to see upgrades to the catch systems ahead of testing. Thanks again to Vix for this clip from Lab Padre, this time with views from Rover 2 camera at the launch site, which caught initial landing rail lift tests following the recent upgrades. We can also see new style bumper cushions have been installed ahead of testing with B14.1. These new ones feature a hollow profile and spring systems that compress inward, and the spring systems appear to also allow the inside surface to deflect downward. This feature is likely to prevent them from being ripped off the rails from the downward motion of the booster as it's being caught. One other observation in this video is the absence of scaffolding surrounding the arm actuator of the right chopstick. Another great sign that the chopsticks are nearly ready for testing. And that's it for episode 54 of Starbase Flyover Update. Thank you for continuing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography and I hope you all enjoyed the flight. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on the new videos each week, and leave a thumbs up. I'd also like to give a special shout out to all the Patreon members that participate in the regular show and tell sessions for sharing their individual areas of expertise. I'm Jeff A, and we'll see you next week from 10,500 feet.